Um, before I actually do um, go into electing new officers, I would like to just list our board members right now. These are the friends uh, board members. And if you are here, just sort of raise your hand so people can kind of identify and see who is actually on the friends board. Uh, Arlene Alexander, Barbara Brown, who's vice president, Marlis Crafton, myself, Debbie Dunaway, president, Brucey Ferris, she's a new member, right? Kathy Hedgeka, which is membership chair, Tom Jakes, Lori Malfi, Susan Morgan, Fran Pangle, she is a new one, Elizabeth Quick, Lynn Ridley, who is secretary, Susie Thurman, Patty Twiddell, who's treasurer, and Linda Walters. Okay, so most are here, but there are still a few that couldn't make it tonight. This is kind of a good travel month, so a lot of people are out of town. Um, our current, uh, I'll, I'll start with this. The slate of board officers that we have to present and we're going to ask for nominations afterwards. So if any uh, friends members want to nominate somebody, they're certainly welcome. Uh, and this is for the year 2019-2020. Okay? Uh, myself, Debbie Dunaway, I uh, would, would be president next year, unless we have some <laughs> other nominations. Barbara Brown would be vice president. Lori Malfi, secretary and Patty Twiddell, treasurer. Kathy Hedgeth, membership chair. Um, are there any nominations from the floor for, for new officers? Not, okay. Well, let's take a vote then. All those in favor of those that I've listed, voting for them, just raise your hand. Uh, if there's anyone who disagrees, raise their hand. Okay, it's unanimous. So we will, our new officers will be myself, Barbara, Lori, Patty, and Kathy. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now the fun part of the night is our guest speaker. Uh, this is Lori Malfi, who's standing over here. She has been a Friends member for about four years. She's been on the board, actually. She's been a Friends member longer, but she's been on the board. Um, she is originally from Washington, D.C. She attended Ohio University and earned a B.S. and a Master's from that university. She's actually lived in Henderson 33 years. She, her husband, who is sitting off over here, is from Buffalo, New York. He is academic dean at Owensboro. Uh, community and Technical College. They have one daughter and she's also in academics. She is a doctor of political science in her third year of teaching at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. So uh, at this time, Lori's professor of history and political science at the Henderson Community College. Uh, she has taught there since 1987. So she's been there a while. <laughs> So, uh, she's going to talk to us. Now, the topic actually is Henderson County Public Library, a community endeavor. But she's going to give us a lot of really interesting facts on the, on the, the library and coming through the years. So, Laurie, thanks. So, thank you all for coming. And I hope I tell you a little bit about the origins of the Henderson County Public Library that you didn't know. Although, I think some of you probably know a few items, but because I wasn't born here, much of the information was relatively new to me. So, my way of introduction, I thought that uh, Gil did a nice uh, kind of promo 
uh, for what I was going to talk about because it seems to me very appropriate that with the newest expansion of the public library currently underway that we take a look back at the origins of the public library and we are reminded of the role of the library in the community. So I think what Caleb did was pretty good, kind of indicating the, the, the contributions of the library to the community. So Kenneth Bresch, who wrote a book called American Libraries 1730 to 1950, he reminds us that libraries really are more than just places to get books. They are community and cultural centers, which I think we've really proven that already. The Henderson County Public Library really has um, part of its origins in Andrew Carnegie. And I want to tell you a little bit about Andrew Carnegie and his role in the foundation of the Carnegie Library, which is the oldest part of the library. So you can see here different pictures of Andrew Carnegie as he aged. So he was born in 1835 in Dunfermline, um, Scotland. And Andrew Carnegie, to his biographers, wrote that, or he, he told his biographers that he grew up listening to men talk about books that were borrowed from the tradesman's subscription library. And his father actually helped to found that particular library. Then at age 12, uh, Carnegie immigrated with his parents to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he worked as a bobbin boy in the textile room. Uh, then, as he got a little older, he took a job as a messenger boy for a local telegraph company. And it was there that he learned to be, uh, he learned um, the role of uh, telegraphy. So it was when he was at the telegraph company, Carnegie had a very interesting experience. Um, he was introduced to the Allegheny iron manufacturer, uh, Colonel James Anderson. And every Saturday, Anderson opened his 1500 volume library to the working boys. And Carnegie remembered fondly going to that library, reading the books, and the pleasure he got from reading. Then, in 1853, Colonel Anderson's representatives tried to, to restrict the boys' access to the library. So Carnegie, now this was a pretty sharp kid, Carnegie wrote to the editor of the Pittsburgh Dispatch, defending the rights of the working boys to enjoy the pleasures of reading. I'd love it if my students said they <laughs> Every time I assign a book, it's hug. Anyway, Carnegie resolved at that point in his early life that if he should ever be wealthy, he would make sure that similar opportunities were made available to working people. Now, over the next half century, uh, Carnegie would accumulate the fortune that really would enable him to fulfill that pledge. Uh, he was a messenger boy. After being a telegrapher, he was a messenger boy. Uh, excuse me, he was a messenger for the um, uh, for the for the telegraph company, and he became very skilled at tel uh, as a telegrapher. And then this put him into contact with the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, where he went to work at age 18. So he'd already had a pretty big career before he was even 18 years old. He worked for the railroad for 12 years, uh, during which time he steadily was promoted, and he eventually became the superintendent of the railroad's Pittsburgh division. Along the way, Carnegie saved his money. And he gradually invested money in all sorts of side businesses like railroad locomotives, oil, iron, and ultimately steel. In 1865, Carnegie left the railroad to manage the Keystone Bridge Company, which an interesting thing is that the Keystone Bridge Company at that point was shifting, kind of making a transition from wooden railroad bridges to iron bridges. And this is what I think helped to spark his interest in 
steel. So beginning in the 1870s, Carnegie started manufacturing steel. He founded the Carnegie Steel Company, which turned out to be an extremely successful enterprise, so much so that in 1878, he took a year off and went around the world. I'd like to do that. <laughs> he ended his trip in his birthplace, Dumbledore, <coughs> Scotland, uh, where he actually met his mother. They kind of met up uh, there. And he was so taken with the town where he was born that he offered the community a very generous grant to build a library. The, the grant had some conditions. The condition was that the town leadership had to support the library once it was built. Well, the community chewed over this idea for a while, and then in February 1880, the community accepted Carnegie's money. Uh, Carnegie's first library grant in the United States would be in Braddock, uh, Braddock, Pennsylvania, and the purpose of this library was to serve the steel workers who worked in his Homestead, Pennsylvania plant. Now, about 1901, Carnegie sold his steel company for $250 million. Now, if that's in the billions today, that money would be in the billions, but personally, uh, in 1901, I think $250 million, I could live on that, <laughs> couldn't you? So, Carnegie, after he sold his company, he retired, and he devoted the rest of his life to philanthropy. But before he retired, he gave it a lot of thought. What do I want to do when I retire? I, I'm sure some of you have thought that. What do I want to do before I retire? So he started writing articles about um, the issues of the day. And his most famous article was titled Gospel of Wealth. And in this article, which, which by the way, he wrote several different versions of, but um, the essence of his argument, his position is the same. Uh, whether you read the first version or the second or the third. Anyway, in this article, Carnegie wrote that, quote, it is the duty of the man of wealth to dedicate his surplus wealth to funding schools and colleges, libraries, hospitals, public parks, concert halls, public baths, church buildings, or other institutions as he sees fit. <coughs> Further, Carnegie said, it was the responsibility of the man who accrued the wealth to decide, in his lifetime, how his money should be spent to benefit the public. Wow. Having declared he would give away his money, Carnegie now set to work doing so. So Carnegie spent his time um, in two ways. His Early on, his philanthropy was in giving money to fund libraries, and he also had this love of church organs, and so he, he donated a lot of money to church organs. Uh, that isn't all he donated. I mean, he donated to other projects, ultimately, but these were two passions, two particular passions. As someone said later on that he was the patron saint of libraries. Um, he had some kind of interesting ideas about how his money should be spent for libraries. For example, he would not give any money to state libraries, state historical society libraries, proprietary or subscription libraries, because all of these had access to alternate funding. Carnegie also refused to give money to buy books. He believed that the local community should select the books that would best serve the needs of the people in their community. So this, the whole of uh, 
Carnegie's desire to give money to support libraries happened about the same time that state and local governments began to assume responsibility to build, maintain, and staff hospitals and schools. But state and local governments would not support funding libraries. So Carnegie came up with this formula. Carnegie would donate money to build a library, provided that the community would supply the land and pay 10% of the building cost each year in taxes to maintain the library. Now, Carnegie biographer uh, David Nassau says that <clears throat> Carnegie's real purpose was not to fund the libraries himself, but to push communities to take care of themselves, to take care of the libraries themselves. It's an interesting point of view. The two men who really um, oversaw the library grant projects were James Bertram and Robert Frank. Uh, these two men were with uh, Carnegie a long time. They served as his private secretaries. And Bertram was very detailed. He was, you know, your perfect secretary. He's very, very detailed, uh, very, you know, let's cross that T and dot that I kind of person. And he created an application form that required applicants to submit detailed information about their communities. Besides providing the name, the community applicants had to uh, uh, give the population size of the community and indicate whether or not whether there were any libraries in the community and, and whether those libraries were public or private and, and well just how many books did those libraries have. If they already had a, a pretty substantial library, he would deny the request. He also was insistent, as Carnegie had been, that the town provided a site, that the town purchased a lot on which the library could be built, and that there would be an annual library tax to support the library, its maintenance, year after year. Uh, Bertram had complete authority to approve the applications, and then Franks, who was Carnegie's fiscal agent, actually wrote the checks. So in his lifetime, that is, until he died, he died in 1919, until he died in his lifetime, Carnegie and his foundation helped to establish more than 2,800 libraries at a cost of some $60 million. That's very generous. Now, one quick comment is that um, Carnegie not only supported libraries in the United States, but he also supported libraries outside the United States. You know, many countries like Australia, South Africa, and other countries received Carnegie money to establish libraries. Another quick comment is that, um, can you imagine getting tired of being a philanthropist giving your money away? <laughs> I, I, it does just blows my mind. But in 1911, uh, Carnegie decided that he was worn out. He was 76 years old, and he was kind of worn out about all this philanthropy. So he created a, what he called the Carnegie Foundation. And in the first few years, the Carnegie Foundation consisted of Carnegie himself, James Bertram, and Robert Franks. So they were still making all the decisions. Um, after he died in 1919, the foundation you know, really was reorganized. So I want to turn to our Henderson Public Library. And this is a postcard of the Carnegie part of the library. I read that prior to 1904, that Henderson residents had really limited access to libraries. 
Uh, there were several small and private libraries, such as at the Masonic Hall, uh, St. Paul's Episcopal Church, and at other church schools. Uh, the public schools, for the most part, had very few books available for the teachers or the students. Somebody who understood <coughs> that libraries were important was Edward Asher Jonas. Um, in 1899, Edward Asher Jonas, who was an immigrant from England, and he was the editor of the Henderson Journal, he decided that Henderson really needed a public library. The problem was, as he saw it, was that how to get them, how to get enough money to finance a library. So according to Jonas, in a letter that he wrote <coughs> to Susan Tolles uh, in, I think it was 1909, uh, Jonas um, gives an account of how the application to the Carnegie Foundation uh, developed. Um, according to Jonas, he became acquainted with uh, Andrew Carnegie, with whom he occasionally played golf. Uh, during a round of golf, uh, Jonas broached Carnegie, be Carnegie about the subject of uh, a library uh, that was needed for the city of Henderson. Carnegie was pretty straightforward. He said, yeah, I'll find a library provided the city of Henderson buys a suitable lot and levies a tax to pay for the library's annual upkeep and maintenance. Well, Jonas, on his own, actually began giving lectures and, according to him, other forms of entertainment <laughs> to raise money <laughs> to <laughs> help build the library. In December 1899, Jonas actually completed the application uh, to the Carnegie Corporation requesting $25,000 to, to build a library in Henderson. Now, the real corporation, you know, Bertram basically wrote back and said, okay. Um, so in July 1901, Bertram granted the request and over the next two years, uh, money arrived in stages um, from the Carnegie Corporation. Well, this looks very much chronological, and it is, but um, I just wanted to have it there so that you would see kind of the progression. Um, in March, uh, March 21st, 1902, the Kentucky General Assembly approved a law prompted actually in part by Carnegie's library grants. The Kentucky law would provide for the establishment of free libraries and reading rooms in cities and towns in the state. The law authorized cities and towns to levy and collect an annual tax not to exceed 10 cents on each $100 of assessed taxable property. All monies collected would go into a library fund held by the city treasurer, but kept separately from the city's funds. The law required local leaders to adhere to the financial terms as outlined in the Carnegie Corporation grants. The law also <coughs> authorized the city or town leaders to appoint a five-man library board of directors to oversee the creation of the library and to set the rules and regulations of the library. And then last, the law required the library board to submit an annual financial report to local authorities. So that's exactly what the city of Henderson did. On May 3rd, 1902, the Henderson City Council, led by Mayor Powell, uh, formed a public library board of directors. And the members included S.K. Sneed, who was elected president, uh, J. Hart, John W. Lockett, James R. Rash, and N. Powell Taylor. I'm personally not familiar with the individuals, uh, so uh, some of you may be. I think it was funny to me reading the, the minutes of the public uh, library board 
because the first meeting of the board was held in the Henderson National Bank. And the first thing that these board members did was to review the Kentucky law, the 1902 law that required um, the, the outlined the terms to build, equip, and maintain libraries for the free use of city residents. The board then advertised for bids to purchase a lot, a suitable lot, on which to build the library. Uh, there were five different bids. Um, in my mind, I could place these bids around town, but on July 1st, 1902, the board voted four to one to purchase a lot owned by Mrs. Ruby Dallum Dudley for a lot on the corner of Main and Washington Streets. The board was going to pay, her bid came in the lowest, at $4,000. I don't know anything about how much property is worth today, but my guess is $4,000 for the corner lot, you know, 105 foot square by 130 foot square lot on the corner of Washington and Maine today would go for what? A lot. Now, once the purchase was approved, the board selected the architecture firm of Harris and Chef Bell of Evansville out of seven bids. Some of these bids came as far away as Des Moines, Iowa, um, Louisville, that's not so far, but the, the firm of Harris and Chef Bell of Evansville had the charge to draw up the plans for the building. Then on November 3rd, the board approved the architecture's plans. Three days later, the board awarded the building contract to a Henderson firm of Mondo and McGraw. Their bid to build the building, $18,739. <laughs> what would that build in our new building? We couldn't even get what? Can we get a restroom out of that? <laughs> Maybe a couple restrooms. Maybe a couple restrooms. <laughs> How building prices have changed. Then on December 16th, the library board elected, they did not hire, they elected Miss Susan Sterling Tolls to be the librarian. Her annual salary was $480, $40 a month, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Ms. Tolls was very serious about taking up this job. So before taking on her duties, official duties, February 1st, and she, she did something very interesting. She traveled to Washington, D.C. to go to the Library of Congress to learn about classification and cataloging techniques. When she came back, she introduced the Charles Cutter classification system, not the Dewey system we're all used to. The board also hired one janitor and one groundskeeper, each of whom received an annual salary of 420, excuse me, an annual salary of $240 a year. Wow, $20 a month. They were really. <laughs> now, construction on the building uh, began March 20th, 1903, and it was completed by March, early March, um, 1904. In between time, the uh, board approved a lot of bids. Uh, for things like heating and plumbing and gas and electric light fixtures, uh, furniture, shelving, and even interior decorating. The library was built in the classical style, meaning that the library had large columns in the front, on the front porch, a rotunda, and for the decoration, the library has a beautiful dome uh, the interior of which is uh, the, at the top is a, a stained, a kind of octagonal uh, stained glass skylight. And then 
hanging from the skylight is this uh, chandelier and the the mural, there's a mural painted um, in the interior of the dome. Um, there are four uh, Greek goddesses, um, each representing, one represents art, science, music, and literature. Um, this particular mural was refurbished in 2002, and uh, so it looks very bright now, but you know, over time it probably got a little bit, what? Rich. Right. So uh, one other thing about the, um, about the library, um, by the time the library was open for business, and by the time it was dedicated, uh, the library claimed 500 books, uh, most of which were selected by Ms. Tolls. Now, in addition to the library on the corner of Maine and Washington Streets, a separate one-room library annex was built at the rear of the 8th Street Colored School, which is located, which was located on the corner of Elm and 8th Streets. This is very significant because the Henderson Library Annex was the first structure in the United States built specifically to provide services for African-American residents. Now why didn't they just put them together? Well, the library board believed it was important to provide library services to the African-American community. However, as long as those facilities were segregated, the library board feared that the white community would not patronize the main library if it were integrated. And it's very clear, even in Ms. Cole's letters, in her comments, that there was a lot of concern that the library would not be a success if it was integrated right from the start. And given the context of the times, that wouldn't, that wouldn't have been the case. Now, the libraries were dedicated August 1st, 1904. It was a Monday. August 1st, 1904, and separate dedication ceremonies were held at the main library and at the annex, the library annex. Uh, interestingly, the library annex celebration was 5 o'clock and the main library celebration at 8 p.m. Um, the mayor, Mayor Powell, Edward Jonas, John Lockett, and others spoke at both ceremonies. The interesting thing is that both libraries were free and open only to Henderson City residents. It wasn't until 1942 that the Henderson Fiscal Court approved an annual appropriation of $500 to extend library services to people who live in the county. One of my colleagues told me today that his mother uh, is still angry <laughs> because she couldn't come to the library. Um, if you were not a city resident, you had to pay a $2 library fee or library kind of subscription. And he said that his mother, growing up, didn't have $2 to spare to come to the library. So she's, I'm sorry, she's not going to be a good patron. <laughs> she's still, you know, kind of been out of shape over it. So I wanted to tell you one quick thing about Miss Tolls. Beginning in 1905, Miss Tolls diligently put together an annual report that revealed steady growth in both the library collection and in the library's patronage. But one issue, however, um, served to frustrate Ms. Tolls. And this is it. For several years, the Carnegie Foundation classified the Henderson Library as, quote, delinquent, unquote, because the library annex was built with funds not authorized by the Carnegie Foundation grant. 
In addition, the Carnegie Foundation was unhappy with the city of Edgerson for failing to provide each year the sum of at least $2,500 for the regular maintenance and upkeep of the library. I saw the figures, and on average, if you average out the years, it was $2,500. But some years, the amount of money that was collected in taxes, city taxes, was uh, $2,400. Uh, some years it was uh, higher, so 26 or 2800. So it kind of averaged out. I told you Bertram was very picky. <laughs> now, correspondence exists in the library itself uh, showing that Ms. Toll's persistent efforts to convince the Carnegie Foundation to remove Henderson from the delinquent list ultimately paid off. <laughs> so, I think that she would have been uh, a force to be reckoned with. And I have for you all a copy of the 1904 Rules of the Library. <laughs> so as you read the library rules, I, I think you'll be kind of amused by some of the rules. No dogs allowed and men take your hats off. No smoking in the library. I want to continue my presentation with uh, just kind of a highlights. I want to talk a little bit about just give you an idea of some of the highlights of the library's growth since 1904. And as Caleb very very uh, appropriately mentioned, you know, the library has provided a multitude of services to several generations of Hendersonians. So here are some highlights uh, marking the growth and expansion and, and development of the library since 1904. So you, some of you may recall that in Henderson there was a, a cotton mill in the Audubon District. So in 1909, a branch library was opened in the Audubon School District for workers at the Henderson Cotton Mills. And this, yeah. I'll just repeat that. <laughs> so in 1909, a branch library was opened in the Audubon School District for workers at the uh, Henderson Cotton Mills. And this uh, annex was supported by the Henderson Women's Club. The branch finally closed in 1932 because the cotton mill closed. Uh, but that same year, Henderson's library became a depository of public documents for the second congressional district. So we had government documents, we were a depository. Um, and two, two rooms in the basement actually contained 100,000 documents, government documents. Well, in 1934, the depository was transferred to West Kentucky College. In 1950, the library annex uh, kind of outgrew its space and moved to the top floor of the Isidore Center at the corner of Dixon and Alphasia Streets. Um, that was a, a better location, I think, probably, and more space. Uh, that same year, the library's basement was, the main library's basement was modernized, and shelves were installed, and this is when the main entrance to the library was moved to Washington Street. Uh, how many of you actually you attended the library, went into the library through the, through the main street? So, all I've ever known since I've been here is entering through Washington Street. In 1954, the main library and the library annex merged, and so segregated library services were now a thing of the past. That same year, the library got its first bookmobile. 
uh, to provide library services directly to the community. And I don't know if you remember this lady, but Bonnie Paik was the first driver of the bookmobile. I bet she never thought she'd be remembered. <laughs> In 1960, uh, the library underwent a major renovation, um, and the staff also switched the library books from the Cutter um, classification to the Dewey classification system. Apparently, that process took five years. I don't know how hard that is, but I imagine it was a big job. In 1967, an outside book drop was installed in the entrance of the Washington Street entrance, which was a good thing for people like me who want to return books at midnight. <laughs> then in 1974, a state grant of $250,000 was offered to expand the library, uh, but there was a catch. The city and the county governments had to match the money, uh, not quite $250,000, but $125,000 in matching funds. The expansion project uh, was very controversial. Uh, I think several important people resigned over this controversy. And um, the, the renovation expansion did not actually get underway until 1979. Uh, the new library edition that was built between 1979-1980 doubled the size of the library and cost a whopping, well, nope, I didn't put the amount of money. I seem like I'm very interested in money tonight. <laughs> uh, no, um, that's the next expansion. So the new, the library edition, that doubled the size of the library was dedicated on May 4th, uh, 1980. Then in 1999, the library underwent another expansion with an increase of, increased the library about 3,000 square feet. And this time the cost was $775,000. All of this money was donated. It wasn't a grant, it was donated. So the new addition is what led to the children's department, lots of new carpeting, and very important fire suppression system. Between 2002 and 2004, uh, the library um, underwent renovation in preparation for the 100th anniversary of the library. And this is when the library added free, high-speed wireless access to the internet for patrons. And this has made a big change to the library, I think. It's probably brought more patrons in. And then, you all are familiar with this. On April the 10th, 2019, uh, this was the, the date that uh, ground was broken for the new edition of the library at $8 million. And again, it's a two-story edition. It, it provide a lot of new services, a lot of new facilities for the community. So another, another picture of the library edition uh, from the new parking lot, which we sadly need. <laughs> now, I, I have two final thoughts. On Tuesday, August 18, 1919, the Henderson Public Library Board of Directors met to discuss the death of Andrew Carnegie. He died at 84 years old in 1919. And at the time of his death, Carnegie spent nearly a quarter of his life engaged in philanthropy. His gifts to various charities totaled $350 million, or close to 90% of his fortune. The library board on this occasion approved a resolution expressing its sadness over Carnegie's death, but also appreciation for Carnegie's gift to Henderson. And I'm quoting from the resolution, quote, on behalf of all the men, women, and children of the city and county of Henderson, 
we express our gratitude for a gift which has been and will continue to be a force for good in this community. All men everywhere must hope that his example may not be lost and that his splendid benefactions throughout the world may never cease to be the living forces for good and that they may accomplish in the fullest measure the splendid purposes which inspire them. So I think the Henderson County Public Library continues to fulfill this mission of providing worthwhile services to the citizens of the city and county of Henderson. I think Andrew Carnegie would be proud of the institution that his money helped to fund. Now, one last comment. Uh, Donald Watman, who many, I'm sure everyone in here knows, uh, when he retired, just before he retired, the Gleaner interviewed him. And in this 2011 interview on the eve of his retirement, Donald was, I think, waxing eloquent when he said that, you know, a public library is a very tangible thing. We tend to take it for granted. If Henderson is going to attract industry, the library is one of the things that people look at. It is one of the gauges outsiders use to measure the health of a city. So I think based on the current expansion project, I'd say that the city of Henderson is flourishing. Thank you very much. May I add something about Andrew Carnegie? Sure. There's a book that I just read. It's called Carnegie's Man. And it's a historical fiction. I'm recording it on my book book this week. But I was walking my dog not long ago down to the Red Bench Park. Yeah. And there's, a, there's this, you know, little history thing. Yeah. And it says, uh, he stole Andrew Carnegie's Keystone Bridge Company. Built the first bridge that went across the river. Wow. So she Wow. Oh, <laughs> It is, and I, to me, one of the like, like, startling moments was to realize that um, the library annex was the first in our nation to provide a facility <coughs> for African Americans, and I think that is, and, and the fact that you know the the board and the library got flack over that, I think says a lot about the. Do you have any particular questions? I just think it's wonderful that the library is keep on growing and uh, I guess I came to the library when I was in grade school, came on a trip, class trip. I was so fascinated. I went home from school that day, asked my mother if I could get a library card. She says yes, so I walk all the way back up to the library the same day, get the papers, take it home so my mother could sign it, and I walked all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been there since. Yep. Well, I've even had my time working there, you know. Yeah. It just, I just think it's a fascinating place. Well, it's and a great facility for this it community. Is. Mm -hmm. It is. I've been to, you know, other libraries in other cities, but seems to have a life would be safe. Well, I, maybe this is too, too small of a word, but a charm. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the original, you know, you can, if you get them, you can still feel. Oh, yeah. But there's a kind of vibrancy in the library. There's yeah. always something going on. And uh, there's a book that was recently written. I think the name of it is the library, and I'm sure a lot of people in here read it, but it tells the history from the very beginning. And as I read that, then I launched in back when I was a child, started with the library, and everything in there is just, it's the most wonderful book. <laughs> I can't even remember the author, but it just came out in the last year or so. Well, if you think of what it is, you should tell me. Well, it's in the library. <laughs> it's in the library. <laughs> I can't tell you. The name of it is either the library.